hello and welcome everyone to the third session of the Schoolyard Forest Design Lecture Series. Um, I'm Laura McKenna with Green Schoolyards America, and I'm being assisted by Dante Sudolevsky, and there are many other staff here today. Our agenda will include some intro and updates, presentations by Marcy Rainey, Nancy Strinisty, and Claire Latine, and some Q&A time. This series is a part of the National Schoolyard Forest System, which is a large scale initiative to increase tree canopy on public school grounds across the United States to directly shade and protect pre-K through 12th grade students from extreme heat and rising temperatures due to climate change. California is the first state in this initiative founded by Green Schoolyards America and 10 strands in partnership with CAL FIRE and the California Department of Education. Uh, we hope that the information um, shared today um, and expertise about designing and caring for a schoolyard forest um, will help inspire you all to spread the word and help shift what we see a schoolyard to be and advocate for systems change. We also hope that you will check out the National Schoolyard Forest System Library, which includes many resources on designing, implementing, caring for, and using schoolyard forests, as well as curriculum ideas, helpful articles on the rationale and case studies. Um, one to highlight is uh, the design, implementation, and maintenance of schoolyard forest resource, which offers guidance on how to design, build, and steward schoolyard forests and how to encourage student voices to be included in the process whenever possible. Uh, it also includes a climate appropriate tree list, which we will share more about at the next uh, lecture on December 7th. A reminder that these sessions in this series are the first Thursday of each month from 11 to 12 Pacific time. We have one more lecture this year on December 7th, selecting trees for schoolyard forests, and we will continue next year, starting in February, 2024. Uh, topics to be announced. The series will provide technical design focused guidance for creating and stewarding high quality green schoolyards and schoolyard forests. You can find more information um, and the registration link in the chat. Please invite a friend next time. All the lectures are free, open to the public and a recording will be available on that same link afterwards when it is ready. So I am very excited to welcome today Marcy, Nancy, and Claire to share some really rich, impactful information with you all today. They'll introduce the importance of centering children when designing schoolyards and how schoolyard forests can enhance children's mental and physical health, learning, and play. Uh, they'll present research outcomes, principles of childhood development, nature play, and physical activity, as well as specific design strategies we will have some Q&A time after all three have presented. So please type your questions in the chat and we'll address them at that time, as many as we're able. Um, we'll also post their bios in the chat. And at the end of each presentation, we'll share some relevant links um, that they share in their presentation and research. So a little bit about each of our guests today. Marcy Rainey is currently a senior program manager in the Office of Wellbeing at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and former associate professor of kinesiology at Occidental College. She maintains the certified exercise physiologist and certified playground safety inspector certifications. She has over a decade of experience collaborating with public health departments, school districts, hospitals, and nonprofits to evaluate <clears throat> family-focused, and school-based health program interventions. More recently, she's leveraged her educational background, professional networks, and location to decrease income-based disparities in physical activity, participation, and well-being in urban Los Angeles through living schoolyard planning and evaluation efforts. Her work has been published and peer-reviewed in journals, uh, including Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise, the Journal of Physical Activity and Health, Landscape and Urban Planning, among others. She's on the steering committee of the Los Angeles Living Schoolyard Coalition and a consultant for um, our very own California Schoolyard Forest System. Nancy Stranisti 
is founder and principal designer at Early Space LLC and has a unique background as both a landscape designer and early childhood educator. For almost four decades, she's worked with schools, early childhood programs, municipalities, and organizations to create sustainably designed natural play and learning spaces in the mid-Atlantic area and beyond to teach teachers and others about how to use the outdoors for teaching and learning. She is also author of Nature Play at Home, Creating Outdoor Spaces that Connect Children to the Natural World, um, published in 2019. She teaches at Antioch University in New England in their nature-based early childhood education graduate program. She served on the Nature Play work group of the Maryland Partnership for Children in Nature and is on the board of Nova Outside. After 20 years in Arlington, Virginia, she'll be relocating to and designing in the Philadelphia area in the spring. Nancy recently retired from Green School Yards America, where she helped um, all of our team and many others um, to curate the National Outdoor Learning Library and served as the national policy liaison where she focused on advocating for <clears throat> the Living School Yard Act, a bill that's currently before the U.S. Senate, which you can all ad help advocate for. And last but not least, Claire Latine um, teaches and works with community-led, nature-based, and evidence-based design strategies that support mental health and well-being, physical health, equity, and climate resilience. She founded and organizes Chile, the Collaborative for Healthy and Inclusive Learning Environments at Cal Poly Pomona. She leads design studios for Cal Poly Pomona that match landscape architecture students with community partner schools and organizations to develop transformative, grant-ready design plans that nurture a sense of belonging, provide nature-filled places, and inspire awe. Claire is a founding member of the Los Angeles Living Schoolyards Coalition, a research partner for Green Schoolyards America, and is associate professor and chair of Cal Poly Pomona Landscape Architecture Department. Her award-winning book, Schools That Heal, Design with Mental Health in Mind, is a resource for designers, educators, school district administrators, students, and community members. So welcome, Marcy, Claire, and Nancy. Um, and I'll pass it off to Marcy. Thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. I'm going to start my portion of the presentation by highlighting two important issues related to health and academic inequities in student subpopulations, and then discuss how schoolyard forests can help address these inequities. Issue number one, as has been discussed in previous lectures, low-income and BIPOC residents living in urban environments have severely limited access to nature and frequently experience the negative impacts of the urban heat island. Children suffer the greatest consequences when exposed to heat and pollution. There is a physiological response that includes an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, as well as bronchoconstriction and asthma. Asthma is a powerful risk factor for chronic absenteeism, putting susceptible children at a disadvantage in the classroom. Prepubescent girls have lower sweat rates than boys, which is significantly lower than adults. Younger children also generate more body heat due to rapid growth. Children are less likely to perceive increases in body temperature and therefore do not voluntarily take the appropriate precautions to avoid overheating. Dehydration and overheating lead to dizziness, nausea, headaches, fatigue, and decreased exercise capacity. When students return to the classroom, they have difficulty concentrating and learning. Issue number two, the United States has been suffering from a physical inactivity and obesity epidemic for years. It has only been exacerbated by COVID-19. Unfortunately, children are not immune. Inactivity rates are higher for girls, students of color, and for students who live in low-income households. In the United States, only 20% of schools meet the federal physical education requirements. Less than 50% of elementary school students that live within a quarter mile of school walk or bike to school. And during the school day, 
students tend to have minimal breaks in seated sedentary time. Students are also increasing the time that they spend interacting with entertainment-based media. It has been estimated that long-term physical activity habits and physical activity self-efficacy are already established by the fourth grade, which makes early interventions critical. Therefore, in addition to mandating multiple physical activity breaks throughout the day at school, one solution to health and academic achievement inequities is to invest in high quality schoolyard forests. Due to the overlapping and synergistic benefits of nature exposure and physical activity, including immune system function, brain development, improved focus and motivation, improved sleep quality, etc., it is important that schoolyard forests are designed to enhance the curriculum, mitigate the urban heat island effect, as well as promote physical activity. I have worked to elevate the student voice through the collection of free play behavior data at elementary schools throughout Los Angeles County. My goal through cross-sectional and longitudinal research studies is to determine which specific design features optimize equitable participation in physical activity, as well as engagement in healthy social behaviors. The combination of observation and technology-based activity trackers allows my research team to develop a highly nuanced understanding of how children interact with their environment and with each other on the schoolyard. The rest of the presentation will focus on what we have learned and how this information can be applied to schoolyard forest designs. Even when funding is secured and when large swaths of asphalt are replaced with pervious services, plants, and trees, the renovations do not always optimize student benefit. Many landscape designers and architects rely on their adult-centered training and perspective when completing schoolyard designs. Straight lines, well-manicured grass fields, symmetrical plant arrangements, and minimal plant debris are all common. By restricting human control of design and allowing nature to dictate the look and feel of spaces, the space becomes more inviting and less boring to students. It continues to evolve and change along with the students. Students rely more heavily on their own imaginations and creativity. The space also promotes better motor skill challenge and physical development. Interestingly, in our research, we found that the schoolyard square footage does not predict population activity levels. It really doesn't matter how large the schoolyard is if you don't create spaces that students want to play in. Similarly, there was no relationship between the relative green space square footage and activity level, suggesting that nature-based permeable surfaces are not always enough. Rather, our research shows that the greater the number of unique play zones and physical separation of those zones improves utilization of the schoolyard, decreases the number of sedentary students, and increases collaborative play. Greater plant life in schoolyards decreases environmental noise, student anxiety, and increases a sense of belonging and inclusion for all students. Schoolyard forests can help narrow the activity gap between girls and boys. In this slide, we see the change in activity preference over time at a school in Los Angeles that had undergone a large scale greening renovation with schoolyard forest components. Before the renovation, a high percentage of girls and boys selected to engage in traditional playground games 
such as handball, tetherball, and foursquare, using asphalt painted lines and school provided equipment. Immediately post renovation, there was a decrease in the number of girls and boys engaged in sports and traditional playground games, and an increase in students engaging in gymnastics, climbing, jumping, and dance, as well as running and tag. And although several boys had returned to hardscape games 16 months post screening, girls continued to engage in alternative activities on green space. When located on green spaces, there was no difference in activity levels between girls and boys. Schoolyard forests help put all students on the same footing, so to speak, with exposure to new challenges. As seen in this graph, students accumulate the greatest number of moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes when they spend time in small groups of two to four. Small group activity is also related to more collaborative play and higher pro-social interaction frequency. Large group activity, typical of traditional playground games and sport, is associated with more aggressive and competitive play. This slide shows the difference in the open fields of two green schoolyards where we conducted observations. On the left is an oblong shaped grass field with trees planted throughout, representing more of a park-like design. The open field on the right does not contain trees and was originally designed for soccer, kickball, softball, and baseball. The sport field was not a popular recess location for girls, and when girls were observed in this field, they spent fewer recess minutes active compared to girls who played in the park-like grass field. Boys, on the other hand, who gravitate towards ball sports accumulated a similar number of active minutes at both locations. Observations collected pre and post renovation at the school depicted on the right showed that the renovation did not change activity levels. Although asphalt was removed and replaced with large tree planters, there was no change in activity. Most of the trees are in spaces that the children are not. This will also be true as the trees mature. Additionally, the placement of the plants around the perimeter of the tree well prevents students from transversing between the trees or spending time digging in the dirt, which we all know is effective at improving fine motor skills, stimulating creative play, and boosting the immune system. The school depicted on the left is designed with trees and digging opportunities within the play spaces and consistently hosted more active students. During observations conducted at multiple schoolyards, we made note of the following. Benches and trees are often located on the perimeter of the schoolyard. Benches are commonly placed next to tree trunks. This facilitates sedentary behavior in the only shaded area on the schoolyard and sends the message to students that if you want to be active, you must be in the sun. Additionally, trees planted on the perimeter have little impact on the urban heat island. Because trees are isolated to the perimeter, there is a lost opportunity to use natural features to help create division of spaces, welcoming borders, and shaded paths of travel. On multiple occasions, individual students were observed trying to escape from the noise and chaos, but had no place to go. At other sites, ball games bled into one another. Many antisocial interactions and higher levels of sedentary activity were recorded as a result of students not having a place to go and or because of multiple interruptions during activity. Uh, the outdoor classroom on the right was the only green space that was accessible to students at one school site. It was also an area that was shaded and highly popular. Unfortunately, it was so small in size, 
leading to overcrowding and antisocial interactions. The logs, although difficult to see in this picture, were also very close together, which did not provide adequate challenge for older students. The outdoor classroom on the left takes up more space on the schoolyard. There is variation in log spacing, which allows for more collaborative play and age-appropriate motor skill challenge. Although physical activity levels tend to decrease from the first to the sixth grade, students at the school on the left remained active throughout their tenure. Indeed, the older students were the biggest benefactors of the renovation. Play structures that led to higher activity levels are those with unstable surfaces, multiple climbing options, and adequately spaced obstacles to host multiple students at one time. Additionally, recent studies have shown that regular exposure to high temperatures decreases the elasticity of the traditional rubber matting underneath play structures. However, as long as the wood chip layer, more typical of schoolyard forests, is thick enough, this surface meets the head impact criteria 100% of the time due to the ability of wood chips and natural materials to lower impact forces. Although the play structure zone is a highly popular zone across schoolyards, this zone was commonly associated with sitting and standing in the shade under the structure Indeed, approximately 33% of students in the play structure zone depicted on the right were observed sitting and standing, compared to only 11% at the schoolyard depicted on the left. The structure on the left included a swaying bridge, rope lattice for reaching an elevated platform, and multiple opportunities to hang and climb. The components were separated to allow for more students to play and for greater flexibility in how the overall space was used. The type of play observed in outdoor classrooms and play structures with unstable surfaces is associated with better child development and physical activity literacy. In the end, students will learn how to move effectively through balance, coordination, and agility skills in a world that is not flat without succumbing to devastating injury. Schoolyard forests have the potential to replicate the benefits we have seen in well-designed play structures at a fraction of the cost. Randomly spaced logs, stumps, and boulders are unstable, unconnected features that promote climbing and jumping. Natural, movable, non-fixed components can also assist with the development of body, upper body strength and coordination. Trees can also provide shade for one of the most popular areas of the yard. In conclusion, there are many benefits to removing asphalt and replacing asphalt with nature-based features. However, not all green renovations are created equal. The design of the space does matter. To optimize physical activity and social interaction benefits, particularly for students who are the most vulnerable, it is critical that elementary schoolyards are divided into multiple diverse play zones, complete with trees that provide shade and other nature-based features that allow for age-appropriate motor skill challenge and also allow for creative play performed in small groups. Schoolyard forests can help achieve all of these design goals. It is my pleasure to pass it off to Nancy, who's going to provide more specific ideas for achieving these goals through her design suggestions. Thank you, Marcy. And thank you, Lauren and Green School Yards America for this incredible series. As designers, as educators, parents, and professionals, and based on that powerful research Marcy just shared, it is clearly all of our responsibility to provide places where children can regularly connect to nature. <clears throat> we must use the outdoor spaces we have to create living schoolyards, schoolyard forests and natural play spaces that bring nature right outside the classroom door. I'm gonna talk about nature play, especially for early childhood, which I consider 
to be up to about grade three. When I'm creating nature play spaces, I think of the design palette as including tree parts, stone, sculpted earth, soil, sand and water, plants, and trees. <clears throat> and tree parts can be used for all sorts of elements in a nature play space, including for active play, for quiet time, and for edging for paths, sand pits, and planting beds. I recommend using rot resistant wood like locust and cedar, and then stripping the bark, sanding and sealing for the most long lasting wood elements. And still know that decomposition is part of the process in a nature play space. And there can be constructed hills and berms and naturally occurring hills. And these hills can be plain dirt or embellished with slides, tunnels, stump scrambles, boulders. I honestly think that the most play value for the dollar comes from simple piles of sand, soil, mulch, or gravel for climbing, sliding, digging, and engineering. Sand areas are endlessly engaging, especially when enhanced with vertical work surfaces, playhouses with pass-through windows and shade sails. When sand areas are built to drain well, they can double as infiltration. Um, as the example in the upper photo from Constitution Gardens in Gaithersburg shows, Gaithersburg, Maryland, we excavated four feet and backfilled with two feet of coarse gravel and under drains, and then topped that with two feet of play sand. Trees and other plants are key to the design of nature play spaces. They encourage us to use all of our senses. They add fragrance, motion, and sound, color, texture, loose parts for play, and sometimes even edible elements. Trees and plants bring the life to a living schoolyard. I believe that spaces speak. And as a designer, I often have control over the messages that the space communicates. When I design spaces, I begin with circulation, how people will move through the space. Pathways can tell you how to move exuberantly like the long straight bridge in the upper left or carefully like the stepping stones guiding you through a planted garden in the upper right. They can draw you along like the serpentine path in the lower left and provide access to different sensory experiences textures, fragrances, they can guide you past views and provide unique sounds underfoot, the crunch of gravel and the thump of a hollow bridge. In a house, the bedroom, the living room, the kitchen, each have their own purpose that is clear because of the contents of each space. Outdoor rooms within the schoolyard, each with its own mood and purpose are a good way to organize space and help it to make sense to children. The materials underfoot, overhead, and enclosing the room are what define it. Here's a schoolyard in, um, in DC in a space that already had many large specimen trees. So I used the space under the canopy of those trees to define outdoor rooms within the space. The Willow Oak stage, the schoolyard cafe, and the council ring in the shade of the white pines. You can create a destination in the space created by the canopy of a tree by adding picnic tables, a bench around the trunk, or a simple circle of stones that may not look like much to an adult, but is an invitation to children. The tree itself can be the destination with proper surfacing below. Seating circles can often be sited in the shade of existing trees. When not used for gathering, teaching, meeting, storytelling, and conversations, they can double as balance courses. The storyteller's circle on the right is in a courtyard literacy garden and features a giant chair to honor the storyteller and a water feature focal point in the center. Next, I wanna talk about active play in nature play spaces. As our friends at the International School Grounds Alliance say, children's play spaces should be as safe as necessary, not as safe as possible. 
Children need the opportunity to make choices, to develop their abilities and their confidence. If you've ever gone back to a place where you spent time as a child and found that it shrunk, you know that especially for younger children, play elements don't have to be huge to be satisfying to kids. So think about child scale and creating natural climbing elements. The experience of jumping can include jumping off of different elements, jumping from one thing to another, and jumping into different materials like sand or wood chips. Fallen trees and log piles with bark removed and sealed, securely anchored with drainage and safety surfacing below can offer climbing, balancing, and jumping challenges. To support the development of children's proprioceptive sense, it's important to offer opportunities to push, pull, dig, and lift heavy things. These experiences give children a deep sense of where their bodies end and the outside world begins. The vestibular sense is developed by offering opportunities for swaying, rocking, swinging, and balancing. Elements like bench swings, hammocks, and hanging fabric slings help meet the need for vestibular stimulation. It's important to provide places where kids can practice balancing while standing, but also while sitting and places to hang upside down, all of these using their vestibular sense. The, up, the upper photo shows a balance trail where children can travel around the perimeter of this play space without touching the ground. The lower left shows a stilt walk, which offers a place to hold on while moving from one stepping platform to another. And the lower right is a natural balance beam. Using existing topography or adding variations to the terrain is a simple way to add tremendous interest and variety to your site, but nothing is immune to kid erosion, all those little feet going up and down a hill. So it's important to protect the soil. You can cover as much of the hill as possible with hard surfacing like stump and boulder scrambles to help kids get up the hill and embankment slides for coming down and then use plants with dense roots to hold the soil everywhere else. Tunnels encourage crawling and give children the experience of entering in one, one part of the space and exiting in a different place. Caves provide privacy and enclosure, and all those can be part of a hill, a constructed hill or a natural hill. Here are some examples of different ways to use tree parts, stump scrambles, which are uneven steps going up a hill, branching pieces flipped over to create arches and define little enclosed spaces, anchored logs laid out like pickup sticks for balancing, and stumps for climbing and jumping. And here you see a huge cedar log leading to a manufactured monkey bars. Bridges, uneven steps, and ramps all require different muscles and help kids to develop their sense of balance. When children use their imaginations, they try on roles, learn to take other perspectives, explore power and control, they develop empathy, problem-solving skills, leadership, and creativity. These rustic stick cuts each define a child-sized space and provide opportunities to pretend and practice social skills like conversation, negotiation, cooperation. It's important to think about what in the play space supports imagination, language, and social interaction. Humans evolved in green spaces and we feel safe and protected when we're surrounded by leafy plants. I like these structures in the three upper photos that can support vines like mini pumpkins, beans, gourds, even tomato plants, and still give adults a view in. The lower photo shows a living willow bower and a weeping pussy willow tree. Note the little orange feet hiding under the pussy willow tree. To create what we call village play, you need to use multiple playhouses and play structures. 
Having duplicates exponentially increases the amount of language, conversation, cooperation, and positive social interaction. Vehicles are favorite pretending places. They can be repurposed real vehicles like the boat in the upper right, or made from natural materials like sticks and tree cookies. I work with a wood carver in the DC area who has created all these incredible animals for play and school mascots. There's farm animals, woodland animals, and even one school that had a chameleon as their mascot. The opportunity to change their space, to build things and create art gives kids a sense of ownership and control. And those are experiences that build problem solving skills, competence, and confidence. Loose parts like sticks, boards, bales of hay, and countless other things can be used for building an imagination. And they also help to develop large and small muscles, along with planning, problem solving, and cooperation. Small natural loose parts like flowers, bark, shells, stones, sticks, earth, water, and tree cookies of different thicknesses and diameters are things that kids can move, control, and create with, and they add tremendous play value. This stream and loose parts are at Constitution Gardens Park in Maryland. The stream is a stormwater conveyance device as well as a play element. When it rains, it brings overflow from an upper rain garden to a series of lower rain gardens that together infiltrate 100% of the rain that falls on the park and in the uphill neighborhood. When it's not raining, um, there's a kid operated pump and loose parts for damming up the stream. It's not hard to incorporate sustainability into the design of nature play spaces. Here are some examples of real life props and loose parts that allow children to explore issues of life, work, family, and community, taking care of others. Both the idea and the mechanics of feeding and caring are important themes of pretend play for young children. And finally, messy art activities are perfect outside, painting on paper, on mirrors, on rocks, even with bare feet. All of these are important ways to inspire children's creativity. And I want to close with some resources. Um, my book, Nature Play at Home, Creating Outdoor Spaces that Connect Children with the Natural World. Also, you can follow Early Space on Facebook and um, Instagram. And then please check out the Nature Play article in the Green Schoolyards America Outdoor Learning Library. And now I want to welcome Claire Latine. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm honored to be following Marcy's research and Nancy's nature-based design with some lessons presented in Schools That Heal, designed with mental health in mind, with a focus today on considerations for schoolyard forests. 50 years of research shows that viewing and being in nature is healing. Watching leaves or grasses blowing in the breeze, hearing bird song or water, the smell of the earth or the rain, these phenomena attract restful and restorative attention, which research shows calms our breath, reduces our heart rates, stress and anxiety, reduces crime and brings communities together. Over the past decade, I've found three main principles that support students' mental health and well-being: create environments that nurture a sense of belonging, provide nature-filled places and inspire awe, curiosity, or wonder. And I'll share some, a few specific design strategies from each of these principles, starting with nurture a sense of belonging. First, we need to include students and teachers in the design process. Despite the fact they have most at stake from their school design, students and teachers are rarely engaged in designing their schools. The simple act of asking them what they experience and need at school gives us important insights into how schools are used and perceived and helps them feel valued. We can honor students' lived experiences by understanding that not all students learn best by reading or lectures. This physics garden at Pomona College allows students to feel and experience the physical forces they're learning about. This lets children with learning differences feel successful as students 
and lets teachers see students in a variety of learning landscapes. In her 2019 Landscape Architecture Master's thesis, Lisa Strong asked 19 teachers to participate in an outdoor learning intervention, which involved learning, uh, teaching a 30 minute session outdoors twice a week for 12 weeks. Before the study, she asked teachers whether they thought outdoor learning could engage students academically. Unsurprisingly, 78% of teachers said yes, 22% said sometimes, and when asked about struggling students, half the teachers said outdoor learning could engage them. Academically, 50% said sometimes. After the intervention, all of the teachers said it was true, including for struggling students, that outdoor learning could engage students academically. Strong also asked teachers how struggling students faced set setbacks. Before the outdoor learning intervention, 100% of teachers thought struggling students gave up too quickly when faced with setbacks. After teaching outdoors, 60% thought that struggling students bounced back when faced with setbacks and 40% answered that students worked harder. This striking shift in perspective, in perspective lasted after the la learning intervention ended. After returning to the classroom, Three quarters of teachers thought struggling students bounced back, 12% thought they worked harder, and 13% said they got overwhelmed. No teachers answered after the learning intervention that struggling students gave up too quickly. Imagine the impact of students' own self-perception on their ability to learn uh, based on their teacher's treatment and perspective of them. We need to provide small spaces away from activity and ideally in view or in nature to provide respite as well as places to hold community circles for restorative justice. These are the most endangered species of um, outdoor and indoor learning places, small cozy places and quiet spaces. And they're the kind of places that teachers and students ask for the most. The second principle is to provide nature-filled environments. Nature-based design provides many overlapping and cumulative, cumulative ecosystem services to benefit our economy as well as physical and mental health and stronger communities. We can design with nature to create comfortable indoor and outdoor environments with less energy. We can design buildings and classrooms to block the summer sun and bring in the warming winter sun and to allow natural breezes to cool and ventilate interior spaces. Design the landscape so that rainwater from roofs and pavement flows into planting areas to encourage deep roots and recharge the aquifers. This increases the resilience of our landscapes. And we can work with our land management teams to let plants grow to their natural height and form so that wildlife can benefit from them and to let leaves and grasses stay on the ground to decompose and become new soil. This reduces the amount of maintenance needed and reduces noise and air pollution that is so disruptive to learning. We can support students' feelings of safety through design. Radni Matsuoka's doctoral study correlated environmental attributes in 100 Michigan high schools with student behavior and educational success. He found that larger classroom windows and higher human activity levels on the streets in front of schools associated with less student crime, while an open campus policy allowing students to leave freely for lunch and natural features next to school buildings associated with more students planning to go to four-year colleges. Wide open views, on the other hand, even if they were of living grass, like this image on the right, related to more student crime and fewer students planning to go to college. Matsuoka's study found that big open areas made students feel less safe and correlate with more student crime and more student disorderly conduct. 
We can break up large areas like this by placing trees strategically between activity zones where students can most benefit from them, such as over gathering spaces where students eat if they eat outside. And research shows that when about 40 to 50% of a block, a city block, is covered with tree canopy, you start seeing a real reduction in urban temperatures, which reduces the risk of heat-related illnesses. So we can think of a school campus as a city block and try to aim for 40 to 50% of tree canopy cover, planting more, more trees where students spend time, where students can see them from their classroom and cafeteria windows because views of trees helps reduce stress during and after tests and boosts academic performance. Of course, this is only effective if we work with teachers and administrators to uncover windows and uh, forget the myth that all eyes and attention in the classroom must be on the teachers. Students need and deserve visual access to trees and gardens to restore attention and reduce stress so that they can learn. Lastly, we can inspire awe, curiosity, and wonder. Our students need and deserve a world full of wonder and intrigue, a school site that engages their curiosity and sparks the imagination, a place where they want to be. Beauty, warmth, wonder, and awe improve mental health and well being. Dr. Keltner's study of awe has found that awe-inspiring experiences like nature, art, music, and shared experience improves our mental health and brings us together. Most common are the four elements on the top, nature, music, visual design, and moral beauty when we witness people helping other people. Less common in, for awe, it are, but often more profound, are Things on the bottom row, like collective effervescence when fans are madly cheering together in a soccer stadium, for instance, or spiritual experiences. Epiphanies, when we learn something unexpected that changes our worldview. And of course, life's beginnings and endings like births and deaths. In schools, we can think of things like public art, that speaks different narratives to each individually and individual and culturally relevant art, but also the smallest moments like discovering small creatures like snails or roly polies. These are moments that students get so excited about. And during moments of stress or anxiety, these special places and experiences become anchors for students to hold on to. They help students develop an attachment to place that improves mental health and a sense of community and belonging. Students whose curiosity is sparked, who are inspired, awed, or comfortable, are more likely to show up ready to learn. These three principles, nurture a sense of belonging, provide nature-filled places, and inspire awe, can help us design school environments that nourish and nurture our students and teachers, give them places for respite and places to be whole. The physical design of our schools can improve the lives of the hundreds or thousands of children and teenagers that attend each day and support the teachers and staff who are there to help them. If we apply these principles at a whole school district or city scale or county scale, we can improve public health, equity and resilience to climate change by reversing inequitable access to parks, trees, and gardens, and by providing the multiple social and environmental benefits they bring. The US Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy wrote, given the significant health consequences of loneliness and isolation, we must prioritize building social connection the same way we have prioritized other critical public health issues such as tobacco, obesity, and substance use disorders. Together, we can build a country that's healthier, more resilient, and more connected. We hope the presentations we've just given illuminate the many ways living schoolyards and schoolyard forests can support these goals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy, Claire, and Nancy. Um, those are wonderful presentations and a lot of good information to chew on.
Um, we now have, I know um, we're getting close to the end of our time. We only have a few minutes for some, uh, some Q and A. So one, one actually a helpful logistical question um, is how can we implement green schoolyard principles in arid and semi-arid regions? I think that's applicable to the Southwest and, and some other parts of the country. Uh, maybe that's something that uh, Claire or Marcy can speak to just briefly. I'll let yeah. Claire take that one. Um, you know, we, and I see a question about the northern Minnesota as well, cold climates, very hot climates. Um, there are design strategies for helping reduce the impact of cold as well as heat. And in, for instance, reducing cold wind impacts um, and trees there are also shown to sort of help mitigate the, keep the area below them warmer at night as well as cooler during the day. Um, they help regulate temperature in all climates, but we have some really great case studies of outdoor learning environments on the National Outdoor Learning Initiative Library, including in um, Northern Maine, which used outdoor learning environments up there. Um, I would encourage you all to go uh, visit that site because there's some great examples. Nancy, um, do you want to add to that? <laughs> well, I guess I would just say to use use reference landscapes. What's growing wild in the area where you're designing is what is what will grow. So in a more arid space, it wouldn't be as lush and green as it is where I am in the mid-Atlantic, but it would fit with the the landscape of the region. And also part of um the the Schoolyard Forest Library are tree lists, climate adapted tree lists that you can use. They're available for all the regions of California right now, but coming for other parts of the country. Yeah, so thank you. That's a great point. And if I don't know if someone from GSA can put a, a link to that tree list in the chat, um, that would be great. We'll we'll cover that at the next lecture. Um, someone is asking a little bit about um <clears throat> very cold climates, um, like Nancy said. Um, and so to that person, that's that's another thing to, that we are going to be working on. Our tree list currently is just for California, um, but there are many um, tree lists for school districts um, and you can consult different, um, you know, master gardener programs and things like that in your region. I, I can't speak to every area right now though. I wanted to answer this question really quickly about public versus private school settings. Um, most of our, Marcy and I did do all of our work in public, Title I public schools. Um, and so all of the examples that we shared are public, except for mine, I included a private college. Pomona College is a private college. Um, the, the research on the outdoor learning intervention was at a public Title I public school in Los Angeles Unified School District. And the work, the question about the policies and the codes, this is something that Green Schoolyards America, our research team is working on constantly. Um, and some of their resources on that in the Schoolyard Forest Library, as well as the National Outdoor Learning Library are addressing policies. We're trying to get policies to change as well as to give designers and teachers resources to deal with policies today that are already in place. That includes accessibility. And Marcy, maybe you wanna address this question that came up many, many times, the wood chips question and accessibility um, on playgrounds. Yeah, I think that if, um... I'm not familiar with nationwide restrictions, but the CPSI specifically identifies wood chips as a safe, fall safe surface. Um, and you can, the thickness is nine inches uh, to maintain that safety 100% of the time. I do understand the fear and the restriction for certain disabled individual students who may not be able to use those spaces. So thinking creatively of incorporating pathways 
with a different surface, but still allowing for even those who may be mobility impaired to have opportunities to interact with wood chips, uh, I think is an important consideration um, and creating those paths, shaded of course, uh, with trees, but the not thinking that wood chips can't be a part of the environment if you have children that are mobility impaired. Uh, thank you. That's a very um, important thing to know, Marcy. Um, and engineered wood fiber can be can be installed to be wheelchair accessible if you compact the the layers as you're installing it and have appropriate drainage underneath. It it needs to be maintained, but it 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 can be a wheelchair accessible natural surface. Um, there are so many really good questions um, here. I know we are at time and. Um, especially the folks that are asking questions about long-term maintenance. Um, someone had a really beautiful comment about um, subverting, uh, you know, perfection and what we think about surveillance and competition, like adult spaces and what, what um, the like clean cutness of it um, and how, uh, you know, nature full places uh, are quote unquote, messier, but um, I think that's a really interesting uh, comment. So there's a lot of a lot of great questions here. If you go to our, our website and go to the library, you might actually have some of your questions answered there. Um, in some of the other lectures, we do touch on um, accessibility, maintenance, um, why schoolyards look the way they do, why there's so much asphalt, et cetera. So I would encourage you to look at some of those resources. Um, thank you again, Marcy. Claire and Nancy and everyone here today. Um, we hope that we can see you again on December 7th. Um, and if you have questions, you can, you can find any of us at Green Schoolyards um, as well as our speakers. Thank you again.